Cool. Great to be here. What a great crowd. Um, John, I'm thrilled about this. I'm excited. <laughs> so, um, I think Nicole did a great intro for you, but just to recap, co-founder and president of Stripe. Mm -hmm. I don't think Stripe needs too much introduction for this crowd. Uh, worth 9.2 billion, is that a, mm -hmm. a good number for you guys? Backed by the likes of Peter Thiel, uh, Elon Musk, uh, Sequoia, I think the who's who is, in, is backing you guys. So actually before we talk about Stripe, I think we'll take you back even a bit further. I don't know if people in the room know this. You actually founded another company. You had another exit prior to Stripe. Um, can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, so one of the most exciting things for me about the internet economy generally is the declining importance of the uh, geographic, you know, of your precise geographic location and the increasing relevance of just the fact that you are an internet company. And obviously it's not all one or the other, like where you actually are matters, but the kinds of businesses that you can start today in 2018 with the internet audience that's available to you is totally different to what was available to you kind of 10 or 20 years ago. And so in our case, uh, this was, I mean, when Patrick and I were both teenagers, we were these, I mean, young hooligans in Ireland, uh, basically, but we had an idea for, it was, I mean, at the time, uh, it was basically a local selling site, kind of like eBay meets Craigslist meets uh, something else. And, you know, people have done a few of these on mobile right now. Um, but the fact to me that, you know, t again, two youngsters in Ireland could work on an idea and actually get it off the ground and, uh, and get a meaningful audience for it, I mean, that, that is still amazing to me and that's still the kind of thing that gets me really excited and a lot of Stripe users are doing. And of course, the, um, maybe the most useful thing that we took away from the whole experience was the idea for Stripe. Because when we actually went to accept money for what we had built, we're like, wow, this is the hardest problem that's facing internet businesses. And so I think that pattern actually, especially if you look at experienced entrepreneurs, and it's a pattern you see in Silicon Valley a lot, is that you kind of roll your experience from one company forward to the other. And oftentimes just like being exposed to something in the startup ecosystem and seeing how things really work on the inside is, is really useful foundational knowledge for whatever you do next. Awesome, so you were what, like 17, something like that? Mm -hmm. That's incredible. And so obviously that, that gave way to what is today Stripe, but you decided to co-found it with the same person. You're your brother? I don't know if people in the room would start businesses with their brother. What's it, what's it well, like? It depends <laughs> on the sibling, obviously, yeah. Um, what is it like? Um, no, it's great, honestly. Again, it does depend on the brother, so maybe, you know, uh, I just had like do a quick analysis of, you know, the particular sibling and the, and the strengths and weaknesses uh, therein before you go jumping into starting a company with your brother. But for us, you know, it's the interesting thing about Stripe and the Stripe opportunity Stripe's in a way a kind of obvious business to start, right? You know, businesses online should be able to accept payments. They should be able to do so all over the world. It should be easier to get started and not harder. I mean, those all seem like tautologies almost. And so then you ask yourself, okay, you have this giant problem. You know, we think of it as like one of the last Google-sized problems on the internet, uh, just the economic infrastructure that underlies it. So you have this giant problem. Why hasn't it been solved up to now? But why was it the case that we could solve it in 2010 and you know no one had and part of what we found out is as part of it is you know I, I said to Patrick when we were starting Stripe oh you know we should just do it how hard can it be the answer is really freaking hard actually <laughs> um, and so we've been working on this for you know, eight or nine years now and we still feel like we're we're just scratching the surface and so what, what was really useful to me about starting the company with with Patrick is if you are embarking on a really long term, and I mean like multi-decade endeavor with someone, and it's not going to be particularly easy. You have to assemble, you know, Stripe is now a thousand people. You have to assemble the team that's actually going to do it. You want a lot of alignment in whoever you, uh, you choose to work on it with. Alignment in terms of you have the same time horizon for solving problems. You're not at different stages of life where you know, one wants to do this for two years and then go off to business school you know, or something else. Uh, alignment in terms of what you value, how you actually want to run the company, how, what your principles are going to be in, in doing that. And I think someone you know really well 
doesn't have to be a sibling, but someone you know really well is, is, a, is a very important part of being able to work on something re as, as a really long-term project. It doesn't just have to be startups, by the way. It can be any kind of long-term endeavor. You look at um, Daniel Kahneman and I Amos Tversky, uh, who are the, the famous um, psychologists who revolutionized the field of psychology. They had this kind of lifelong partnership together. Yeah, I think that's a great thing to keep in mind. Obviously, you don't have to be a sibling, but I think it's very, it's very impressive that you guys have been able to work together that way. So I think there's, we'll talk about payments, obviously, now, because there's so much going on in the payment space. iZettle acquired for $2.2 billion. We have Adyen that's kind of up and coming. I'm wondering if you're kind of feeling a bit of heat from Europe. Uh, what, do you, what do you make of all this? I mean, we're definitely feeling like the European market is... Uh, th there's a reason I spend a whole bunch of time in Europe. Uh, I'm obviously originally from... Uh, Ireland, and it's, it's one of the fastest growing areas of our, our business for us right now. And so it's kind of not surprising that there's a whole bunch uh, happening here. And you look at the startup hubs like London, Amsterdam, uh, uh, Paris, I mean, powered by Thank things you. like, uh, <laughs> a few, remember that one, uh, powered by things like uh, Station F, which uh, is not just, I thought it was funny in the intro, not just the, larger, the world's <laughs> largest startup accelerator in Paris, but the world's largest startup accelerator in the world. Um, and I mean, that's fabulous. Again, you just like, things like Silicon Valley's largest, you know, most interesting IPO in uh, 2018 was the Spotify IPO, you know, mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a European IPO. Uh, it's just night and day versus when I left in 2007. So what, I mean, obviously we, we can see a lot is happening in Europe, but I think probably what's also very exciting is what's happening in Asia. And for people that might be less familiar um, with uh, the likes of what WeChat are doing and things like that, what, what do you see coming out of Asia that really gets you interested? So the, <clears throat> the defining qualities of the Asian markets that make them really interesting and honestly just like really challenging from a business perspective is that they are at a totally different developmental stage and a totally different growth stage to, uh, to Silicon Valley and European companies. And so in a way, Europe and the American markets, they're actually quite comparable, you know, similar GDP, similar top line growth rates of that, very high internet penetration, very high smartphone penetration. And so, a lot of, not everything, but kind of a lot of things have been figured out to some degree, and it's sort of hard to perturb the existing ecosystem and the existing norm. You go to a market like Indonesia or Malaysia or Vietnam, and not everyone has the internet, not everyone has a smartphone, and so the core defining features and services around payments and around e-commerce and just like all the things that we totally take for granted here, those are still wildly up in the air, and it's kind of like the, you know, the 99, 2000 era bubble. The, the whole reason that there was a bubble at that time in kind of uh, mature markets was because the internet was growing so quickly, everyone got excited, and the excitement got ahead of themselves. It's sort of a little bit like that, not exactly comparable, but a little bit like that in the Asian markets, which makes it incredibly exciting for us as a place to invest, because again, we can meaningfully increase the amount of e-commerce that takes place there. It's also pretty hard, because, you know, People are moving pretty fast. And do you see, for example, you have some markets, obviously, that are somewhat, quote unquote, underdeveloped in this space. Do you see markets, for example, Chinese market, as way ahead of the rest of the world? Is it in line? Where, where does it position itself? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, the, the, the Chinese market then is very different from kind of a handful of the markets that I just uh, named because, you know, uh, China is at a much later stage in development, still growing very quickly. But the interesting thing about China is that it has a very separate uh, internet ecosystem from the rest of the Western world. And so, you know, there are lots of uh, European companies that do well in other Western markets. You know, look at a booking.com, who's a Stripe customer, or someone like that. And then uh, lots of American companies that are successful all over the Western world. It's very hard to name Western technology companies that are successful in China, and certainly internet uh, companies. And so they have their whole own ecosystem of Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, are kind of the three major players, uh, and then uh, a small set of uh, kind of startups within that ecosystem. Um, and then in the payments market, it's totally different as well, where they have, again, because they didn't go through the cycle of payment systems being run by, digital payment systems being run by banks and, uh, and people like that, they've leapfrogged to mobile payments. And so if you go to, like, if you're in China today, you don't carry a wallet. Uh, you just use your phone and scan QR codes for everything. So it's a drastically different market as a result of the fact that kind of there's this leapfrogging effect taking place where they skipped a whole kind of credit card penetration step. Incredible. So we have obviously some markets 
Indonesia and some of the examples that you mentioned that are, are somewhat still underserved and, and there's a huge opportunity there. I read somewhere though that in the US you guys are doing something like 50% of all transactions actually go through, Stri is, that, is that true? No, no, it's that uh, a majority of Americans each year buy from a Stripe powered business. So Stripe is kind of a funny business when you think about it. We are more analogous to a cloud hosting provider or someone like this than uh, the typical consumer service you might be you might be familiar with because you know most of the people in this room have probably already bought something from a stripe powered business but again we're trying to put the the business to the forefront we're letting them own the customer interaction with their customer and so oftentimes you know stripe is powering things for people and they might not even realize it that's that's quite something so you guys are working with tons of obviously large businesses small businesses uh, where do you feel is the next huge opportunity in the payment space? We are, so I can't speak to kind of other people who are doing different things in the payment space, but for us in particular, when I said it's the last Google sized, you know, uh, uh, problem or one of the last Google sized problems, <laughs> we're quite fortunate that a lot of the things that we are working on, we're not going to run out of room anytime soon. You know, you sometimes see startups that they work on one thing and then they finish that market and, you know, they have completely saturated the market and then they have to go hop to the next thing. In our case, we're a pretty small fraction of, you know, the total uh, internet commerce market um, uh, so far and there's a ton we can do to enable new startups to grow and capture that. But even beyond that, you know, three to four percent of global commerce takes place online today. We think that's going to be an order of magnitude higher over time. And so we just get really excited about growing the overall size of the internet market. And I think, by the way, that's a very important bit of advice for anyone um, and any startup founders in the room is that there's a, you know, <laughs> a tautology that when, uh, <laughs> when good founders meet a bad market, market wins, when bad founders meet a good market, <laughs> market wins, and when good founders meet a good market, something very special happens. I think there's actually like a relatively accurate piece of advice that the market you choose, and whether it's a growing market, whether there's lots of new adoption in it, uh, gives an enormous tailwind to a startup. And then meanwhile, by picking a very bad market, you can make life really hard for yourselves, and you sometimes see talented teams kind of struggling uphill. I love that. Um, yeah. You've mentioned kind of the google size problem a few times, and I feel like, especially in Europe, we often talk about creating a European GAFA and is it missing? And so there's kind of a lot of obsession around this. But I'm wondering, do you feel like, I mean, you guys are obviously working with a lot of very small businesses. Do you feel like the power, quote unquote, of the GAFA uh, or GAFM uh, is decreasing? Um, <clears throat> decreasing is maybe an odd way to put it because it depends sort of on what time horizon you're looking on. But it's definitely the case that people get very caught up in the current state of affairs when thinking about the dynamics of an ecosystem. And so we're really fortunate that in the technology ecosystem, things move really quickly. Uh, and that's part of what makes it really exciting. But if you were around in 1999, say, people were absolutely terrified of Microsoft. Microsoft could do no wrong. They were, you know, the most valuable company in the world for a time, uh, and they, you know, there was no way they were going to, to, you know, be stopped. And then that faded, and Google became that company. And there's a while where, in the, you know, it was hard to, if you were raising investment for a company, everyone would be asking you, well, what if Google enters this space? And nowadays they don't so much more. And so one is just if you zoom out on a longer time horizon, I think there is always a company that seems like it's totally unstoppable. And just the fundamental nature of this is that large companies uh, tend to be less agile than the smaller startups, and so as a result, smaller startups have this kind of natural tailwind. That said, this is a question that we obsess over, because obviously the health of Stripe's business is very much linked to how healthy a startup ecosystem there is, and you know, we make money when startups grow and make money, and so we're very interested in having there continue to be healthy startup ecosystems. And one thing I think we could, frankly, collectively screw up is to somehow make the, um, the ecosystem harder for startups to work in. And so, for example, I think, you know, uh, it's a happy GDPR day, everyone. <laughs> um, but I, I think there's a really interesting question here where I was talking to uh, the founder quite recently of a company, there are hundreds of people, and in 2018, 75% of their engineering time was towards GDPR compliance. 75% of Stripe's 
you know, uh, time wasn't towards, uh, wasn't towards GDPR compliance. I mean, we obviously had to work on it, but it, we were able to ship other things and do other work uh, while that was the case. And so I think the burden of compliance fell disproportionately on startups versus larger companies where it almost provided an opportunity. And I think watching things like that and making sure it doesn't go in the direction of, say, look at, look at telecommunications that is dominated by a few very large companies. It's not that competitive. Consumers pay pretty high prices. It's hard for new entrants to come along. I think it's very important we don't end up there in the internet economy. I love that you wished everyone a happy GDPR day, and I think everyone in this room has spent way too much time, <laughs> like you, like me, obsessing about the problem having yeah, to deal yeah. with it. Does that mean that we shouldn't treat this topic? What, what is your kind of proposed solution? I can definitely relate to the problem that you've kind of brought up, and I think it's, it's, it needs to be addressed, because I think a lot of the, the people actually making these, these legislations don't realize it. But what is the proposed solution? Well, I think there is... Um, <clears throat> There's, uh, there's, there's two things. One, just acknowledging that there are tensions in any a action that we take. Uh, and so, uh, you know, any time we want to kind of, uh, you know, cr create significant new frameworks on the handling of consumer data or anything like that, you have to acknowledge that it's going to be in tension with something else. And you might decide that the action you're going to take is worthwhile, but you at least have to bear that in mind. I think the second thing is that um, there's this... Uh, phenomenon in uh, um, with fighter pilots called target fixation, where the risk is, you know, you're like coming in and looking at the target or whatever, and like you get so fixated on the target that they actually like fly into it, and this is something that they have to <laughs> teach in, uh, in fighter school or whatever. And I think there's a risk of a sort of target fixation as we look at the, pro you know, we look at the regulators, look at a Facebook or a Google or something like that, and they're saying, okay, well, we don't want to have another Cambridge Analytica scandal happen or things like that, and they could get target fixated and actually end up with the wrong result uh, 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 as a result. And so, you know, an example I gave earlier today was that uh, I think there's a similar kind of target fixation uh, phenomenon that happened where in the wake of the financial crisis in 2008, uh, there was all this new regulation of banks that came in because we don't want this too big to fail phenomenon or whatever. And the large banks actually consolidated power and they've been gaining market share and life has been getting much harder for large banks. And again, I think that would be bad if that were to happen in the course. startup ecosystem. So we can't get target fixated. Well, thank you for pointing that out because I think a lot of people maybe missed that uh, when they decided about GDPR. Um, so I want to talk now about the fact that you and I went different directions. I'm from Palo Alto. I came here. You from Europe, Cross you went the other way. We must yeah. have just like flown past each other. Um, obviously had a good reason, I think at the time, why Combinator and Silicon Valley. Why initially actually did you go? Was it just like, it's not, it can't be the trend of Silicon Valley. It must be a solid reason that you said, that's where I have to go to start my business. Honestly, because that's where the customers were. You know, our early customers, our, we really grew up in serving startups because they tend to be the most eager adopters of new technology. And uh, that was where all our initial customers were. And I think most of the successful companies I know are incredibly customer oriented and th this is certainly something, I mean, it's our core operating principle at Stripe that we put our users first uh, and we're always trying to learn more about how we can make Stripe better for them. Um, and so it was useful to be where the, where the startups were. And so you've been here in Europe all week. You've seen, I mean, you were in Paris. Thank you for coming by Station F. Uh, now you're here. I mean, what do you feel is happening in Europe? Clearly we can admit that something has changed probably since the time you left. Yeah, um, there's, again, uh, I feel like <laughs> the general thing I'm always pointing out, but I really think it's true, is people try to look at the moment in time. They look at the derivative, uh, you know, over a, a tiny, tiny delta, and actually they should just zoom out and look at the changes that are happening on a, on a multi-year or even multi-decade time horizon. Uh, and again, if I just compare, if I take the, the delta between when I left in 2000, you know, 2009, and then uh, now in 2018. Um, it's always been the case that Europe has had a really good base of, of technical talent. Like, many people don't know this, but just there are more software developers in Europe than in, uh, in the United States, even. Uh, but I think the risk appetite has changed in a really exciting way, where it used to be the case that it's like, ah, you're doing a startup, so you're unemployed then, is what you're saying. <laughs> uh, and now there's much more of an energy around startups such that it's almost more socially acceptable to do a startup. I think that's actually really important, given that that, that, that tends to be important to people. Um, you can raise money for uh, an unproven idea, a product that doesn't exist yet, uh, and, and kind of significantly so. Uh, I mean, one of our customers, Deliveroo, uh, they raised a 385 million 
something like dollar. that. Dollar. <laughs> There's definitely a unit attached. I think it was dollars. Um, uh, funding round, a Series F round of funding uh, last year. There was no way you could do that 10 years ago. Like, it's just a, a totally different capital environment. And so I think all the ingredients of the startup mix are, are starting to come together really nicely to form. I don't know, a hearty stew or whatever. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So we're just about out of time. So before we finish, I just want to see how many entrepreneurs in the room do we have? Raise your hand if you're an entrepreneur. Oh, quite a few. Quite a few, yeah. So I think there's probably a lot of people in the room that would love to be sitting where you are. What is some advice that you have, actually, for the entrepreneurs out here? Um, one is the customer obsession, uh, the, the thing I mentioned earlier. What I've noticed is that people tend to be customer obsessed in the early days, and then somehow they manage to find other priorities and other things to do, and it's like, wow, now, now I'm dealing with the legal documentation, and I have to take care of the office and things like that, uh, and ensuring that at a company and at a cultural level that, that they don't lose that. And then the, the, the second is probably, and maybe for people who are even pre-entrepreneurship, you know, those who are at risk of entrepreneurship and, you know, maybe contemplating something, um, there's this phenomenon you sometimes see of a sort of efficient markets hypothesis applied to uh, starting startups where, you know, that famous quote from the patent examiner, everything that can be invented has been invented already. Uh, and, I mean, that's obviously not true, but it's so clearly not true. There are giant opportunities just laying in front of you to do things better. And so, like I said, with Stripe, I mean, the idea for Stripe was obvious in, in, is obvious in hindsight. It was also kind of obvious in foresight, in, in, in a way, if you'd been a developer and if you had to, had to solve this problem. Or Slack. L like, let's not forget, mm -hmm. Slack launched a group chat product in 2012, 2013. But, like, people needed to do group chat before 2012, and they were unhappy with all the existing options. Uh, and so, again, it's amazing to me that, you know, you can often go so long, and then a product is so obvious when it arrives. And so I think as you go around your daily life, just like mentally filing away those things that don't quite work as well as they should uh, is, is actually a great source of, of startup ideas. Super. John, thank you so much for being here. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.